Hello everybody. I had received a request to review this book, I think about a month ago. <laughs> I've been a little busy and um, distracted with the puppy and everything, so I apologize for it taking me a while to get to it, but nevertheless, I did purchase this book, I think sometime in 2016, and um, I, it's, it's overdue for me to review it. So. This is the Book of Oberon. Well, that is the title given to this book, and um, it's a source book of Elizabethan magic. So, um, here it'll tell you it is translated and annotated from the Folger Shakespeare Library's 16th century manuscript. And here are the three contributors to this book. I'm going to read the back and then read some selections um, from within the book and show you how the book breaks down. So let's go ahead and flip it over real quick and look at the back. It says, Practical Magic from the Time of Shakespeare. A fascinating addition to the magical literature of the Elizabethan era. This lavishly illustrated grimoire is a must-have for magic practitioners, collectors, and historians. The Book of Oberon is the meticulous transcription and translation of a 16th century manuscript acquired by the esteemed Folger Shakespeare Library. Unlike the more theoretical magic books of the era, this collection of spells, secrets, and summonings was compiled gradually by unknown authors for working practical magic. Now published in a premium hardcover edition retaining the original's red lettering of significant words and holy names, the Book of Oberon includes rituals for summoning a long list of spirits and fairies, including Oberion, fairy king, and close relation to Shakespeare's Oberon, Reproductions of original drawings, common prescriptions used by cunning folk, instructions for dealing with goetic demons that were censored in other texts, one of the oldest known copies of the magic ma magical manual, the what is that word? The incur incur ugh. incurdion, I guess and much more. This is a significant contribution to the annals of magical history, bringing to light the kind of grimoire that was commonplace in its era but is rarely published today. Okay, and um, it is published by Llewellyn, and I do believe when I purchased this book it was $65. I don't know if that's still the standing price, and I uh, purchased it on Amazon. So, I will say that um, it, it's a nice, big, thick book, and a lot of work has been put into this book. It has beautiful end pages. Um, and do I think it's worth $65? Yes, if you want to have a collector's library that um, also has a collection for primarily... Um, you know, high magic or ceremonial magic because that's the majority of what's in this book. But we'll get into that in a moment. Okay, so first let's look at the table of contents. You'll see that there's roughly a 30, 30 page, 31 page introduction. And then there, the rest of the book is broken down into two parts, but really it's primarily this first part. This part, uh, part one, Theurgia. So I'm just going to scan down the different um, little headlines here. Not headlines, but you know, I mean, the little subsections here so you can see that um, what all is listed in here. Now, if you are someone who is entirely turned off by biblical references, um, angels, any kind of uh, high magic, then this is definitely not the book for you. 
you will definitely not appreciate having this book. I don't, I have not read this book straight through. I'm just going to keep scanning down here. I have not read this book straight through. I have gone to different pages that were interesting to me. And some of this is stuff that I have uh, similarly in other books on uh, ceremonial magic. I have the Key of Solomon and uh, a lot of books on the Koetia and whatnot. And um, so you will find a lot of repeated information in here. But this is quite interesting. It is a collection of. people's works and gathering information during the Elizabethan era over um, several years. And I'll, I'll go more into detail. Let me kind of speed up. And if anybody's interested, they can, of course, just pause if they want to look at um, any of this. If I read all this out, it would take forever. And nobody wants to listen to that. <clears throat> okay, so here we are at part two, which is page 491 out of like 555 pages in the book, and it's going over the key of Solomon. If you hear a little scratching, uh, that is Poppy at the door, and I'm just not letting her in for a moment, and I'm not going to pause what I'm doing, I'm just ignoring her. It's better than a squeaky toy, huh? And now I can't ignore her any longer. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pause this and then um, we'll show more in the book. Okay, getting into the introduction of the book. Um, he talks about being in D.C. and going to the Folger Shakespeare Library and um, coming across this manuscript and um, copying it so he can transcribe it and uh, let's see so he's working on it with one of his friends and they decide that they need a better name than the Folger manuscript which, was, which is what they're originally going to call it and since two of the operations were intended to summon the king of the fairies Oberion, a variant of Oberon from Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. They considered those to be of great interest uh, to potential readers, and so they called the whole manuscript the Book of Oberon. And so throughout the book, they'll refer to it as the BOO, the Book of Oberon. Now, personally, that aspect of the book, I find it to be a bit gimmicky um, and just probably just like they said to draw people in because it would cause interest. So as he describes here um, they give the book the title that it has not because that's really primarily what this book is about. There's only two instances referenced in the book as far as Oberion or Oberon the king of the fairies uh, but they knew this would draw interest. Also the illustrations in the book as far as I can tell none of them are original illustrations. They were um, illustrations created for the book by James Clark from, or, okay, suggested by Llewellyn. So then going back through the rest of the introduction, he goes into sort of history in England with um, Elizabethan, Elizabethan England, the way people were with uh, magic and religion back in the time. He talks about John Dee. The book is heavily notated. He talks about what he considers to be the significance of the manuscript. I, I think this is a great book from a historical perspective, but it is definitely not designed in any kind of way to teach anybody about this practice. If you were interested in trying any of the operations in this book you would need to be familiar and comfortable with ceremonial magic that's just the bottom line it's not really about 
fairy magic. When they in this book, when they talk about summoning Oberion or Oberon, whichever name you choose to prefer, it's more like summoning a goetic demon. Now, in my um, experience working with the Fae, is nothing like summoning a goetic demon. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just kind of flip through the rest of the book. You can see the sorts of illustrations they give you. Um, actually, let me go here to the front. Of, uh, well, we have to get past this introduction, don't we? That's about 30 some odd pages. Uh, ending with abbreviations and typographic symbols, which there are a plenty of um, throughout this book. And um, I will go ahead and focus here on the conclusion. It says, The most compelling reason to publish this manuscript is how much it offers the reader, whether a historian, a spiritual seeker, or a casual reader. By the time you read these words, I will have gone over its text at least a half a dozen times, and yet I find something new each time I revisit it. The Prayer to St. George, a fragment of a famous grimoire, or a clue to the origins of the folklore surrounding the toad bone. No set of annotations that we can provide can capture all of these, and it is my hope that having thousands of eyes view the same material might tell us much more about the book and the culture of which it was a product. So I think that's, that's fair. You know, that's a really great... Um, paragraph for the conclusion. I, I can tell they put a lot of love and hard work into this book. And I'm sure the more people that did look at what the information they've gathered, there would be more insights. That's pretty much any magical book, right? But um, I don't really see it for the, most of the people I've met in the witchy pagan community online. I don't see any of them really being interested in this unless you just want to have a collector's library and that including a lot of ceremonial magic. So part one, the Theurgia, Theurgia, I have a hard time saying that word for some reason, um, prayers for purification before the rite and protection. So right away, you're starting off with a prayer. And, you know, it's a, like a Christian prayer. A Christian prayer calling for the aid of God and the angels to help you summon these demons to do whatever operations are work for you. Which, I suppose I should have a separate video giving my thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just, I'm glad to have it in my collection, but it will be put up. I don't plan on referencing it. Uh, I may at some point, for whatever reason, be sparked an interest in me to pull it back down and look at it a little more deeply, but quite honestly, uh, most of the stuff I've seen before in different forms, there are a few tidbits. But I disagree with the tidbits. For instance, treating the Fae as if you're summoning and controlling some goetic demon is just sort of silly to me. Oh, what did I see in here I wanted to show you guys? Oh, I saw something crazy in here I wanted to show you guys. Hold on, let me see if I can find it real quick. Okay, so I've um, selected a few <laughs> bits to share from the book so you can kind of get a flavor for what's inside. Um, here we have the experiment of invisibility. Now this experiment of invisibility without reading verbatim the whole thing, um, this man instructs, I'm assuming other men, that on the day and hour of Jupiter they should make a circle and lie in a, their bed and um, summon these maidens who will come and um, talks about this whole thing about summoning these maidens and how the tiniest and most beautiful will have to give you this ring of invisibility 
Of course, all this is done through Jesus. Um, <laughs> so you go through all this, and he says, With this complete, if they don't come, repeat, and doubtlessly they will come, and they will not fear the circle nor touch the scepter, but they will immediately put themselves around the table, paying respects to you. But you should not leave the circle because of this, but sit, not eat with them. You will see them hasten to eat in a glorious table well equipped, blah, blah, blah. But one of them, the most pretty, the smallest, um, will not speak to you, nor will she face you, but will stand away from the others so that you will be able to offer her the top of the scepter. And you should say as follows. And then you talk about how she's the most beautiful maiden, and she appeared by your power. And she should hasten to the bed without delay, and lie down naked in that place and provide all the comfort they are able without fraud or forfeiture or illusion or physical injury not leaving until they are granted their freedom because they were selected by the Lord and oh I just can't okay so then <laughs> da 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 and you could pause this and read it if you're more interested but it talks about the tricks to be careful for and eventually, you will be granted this ring of invisibility. So, um, it's it's pretty interesting. Here, much further down in the book, he talks. They talk about uh, Mycob is the queen of fairies. Uh, same office as Oberion, and how she appears. And they say she's very meek and mild. And uh, will show a man the nature of herbs, stones, and trees, and uses of medicines, and truth, and that she causes the ring of invisibility to be given to the invocator. So that must be who he was referencing earlier without names. And it talks about these seven sisters. It is for to show and teach a man the nature of herbs and to instruct a man in. And what? Physic, I guess. Mm. And bring a man the ring of invisibility. And they are under my cob, the queen of the fairies. And then you have uh, glyphs for these different seven sisters. Hmm, one's called Africa. Well, that's interesting. All right, so it kind of gives you a uh, flavor. Let me find uh, something else I wanted to show. Okay, so when I was looking through the table of contents, I was excited to see there was a list of pagan gods. And then I turned to the list of pagan gods, and I'm, like, uh, as far as I can tell, mostly Greek gods, right? So I guess that was the only uh, pagan gods they were aware of in Elizabethan England, wherever this was written. So there you go for that. And then, let's see, there was something else I wanted to show real quick. Oh yeah, this next part, and this will be the last part I share, but it's, it's you know, it's, it's graphic. It has to do with a lot, a lot, a lot of animal sacrifice. Like, I haven't even counted the numbers. Okay, so this is the last one I'm going to share. It's... I'm not going to read the whole thing because it goes on for pages of this, but I'm just going to uh, give you some examples. So this says, To make an oil which is precious, most rare, and excellent of all others, for seeing spirits from the air as followeth. And so on various days and hours of those days, you are collecting a variety of creatures and uh, then killing them and saying all these various things while you do it and you have to slay them in a specific way and then you reserve the blood and you reserve the fat and this this goes on you know here we are some more oh yes there's the, a black hat of course even I mean could it be any more stereotypical I could so easily go off on a rant about people and black cats. My daughter actually found a new black cat yesterday, abandoned near the very near, just yards away.
from the same spot I found Poppy. And um, fortunately, this cat is gorgeous. Gorgeous. He's in, He looks great. His coat's good and everything. But um, there's been a rash of people uh, hurting animals in today's modern day people. <laughs> and I really, uh, I've talked to other people about potentially doing a video about this, but I feel like on my channel it would be a bit, a little bit like, a, excuse the expression, but preaching to the choir, you know, I would assume people that watch me aren't participating in that kind of thing. And so what would be the point, right? And people that do that sort of thing aren't going to Ooh, come listen to my video and change their way. So, <laughs> anyway, all right, let me get back to this. So then, here we go. We're reserving more blood in a clean vessel and fat in another vessel. Oh, and here we take a bat. Most of these things I've read, I haven't read the whole thing, but you're taking some creature, mostly flying creatures, but other creatures like black cats and whatnot. And all the flying creatures, uh, you're killing them under the right wing while you're saying certain words and da 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 da. And I haven't even bothered to get to the end of it, quite honestly, because I find the whole thing annoying and ridiculous. Now, having said that, um, I do, you know, I do think it's worth having in my library when I actually get my library set up. But for now, it's going to be put up with the other books that I've put up. Uh, just from a historical perspective, it's interesting, right? Um, but it's definitely not anything I'm going to practice. I don't need to... Uh, I don't need to do any of this to achieve my goals. But it is interesting from a historical perspective. And so since I have it, I have it. And I'm glad I have it. Um, would I repurchase it? Like, would I purchase it now, knowing what all's in there? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm leaning more towards not, but then again, it is interesting, so I don't know. All right, well, if you join me for the review, I thank you for joining me, and I hope everybody's getting ready to have a fantastic weekend, and I wish you many blessings as always, and I will see you soon. Bye.